60-year-old man has a chronic shoulder pain and weakness. X-rays show moderate glenohumeral arthritis and narrowing of the uh, chromiohumeral distance, uh, which makes you worried that he might have arthritis, uh, excuse me, rotator cuff disease. He's scheduled to undergo hemi or total. His postoperative function will be most affected by which of the following? The integrity of the rotator cuff, the integrity of the CA ligament, presence of glenoid wear, presence of an inferior head osteophyte, and the extent of AC joint arthritis. So I think that's pretty straightforward in terms of the function. Uh, that's the integrity of the rotator cuff, whether it's a hemi or a total. Uh, what really happens in the end is going to be related to the rotator cuff, including the subscapularis tendon, which is routinely released, the largest tendon and muscle of the rotator cuff, and then repaired back down into place. So all of that plays a role in terms of the final postoperative function. So we have to keep that in mind as we're managing these things. Um, uh, the, uh, this, uh, there's a, the typical um, hemiarthroplasty over the years has been a stemmed implant. There are some of these newer ideas, especially in patients that have a bad rotator cuff. This is a cuff tear arthropathy head. Uh, again, it's, a, it's a, a fringe procedure now because of the success of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty that uh, Dr. Uh, Levine already went over with you. Um, primary arthritis, uh, so that hemiarthroplasty may be indicated um, if a rotator cuff is deficient. And again, I, in today's world, in the vast majority of cases, that's going to be a reverse. Uh, if it's a 40-year-old patient and they have a deficient rotator cuff and arthritis, that might be a consideration. But even then, uh, their function is going to be better with the reverse. The problem is going to be whether it wears out, but a cuff tear arthropathy is going to wear out too. And so um, uh, that's, that's where we're at. And it says here that you should use a reverse if you uh, can't get the arm up to 90 degrees or the patients with pseudo paralysis. And that's very important. If the humeral head tries to slip out from underneath the coracal chromial arch, there's nothing that's going to work better than a reverse. And that's the operation no matter what the age of the patient. Uh, Three-part fractures, this is a shoulder hemiarthroplasty and four-part fractures. What we've seen over the last decade is that hemiarthroplasty for fracture has diminished and we either try to fix everything, and if that doesn't work, we lean more towards a reverse. And there's still a very strong area where we treat a lot of these non-operatively in our older patients, so you have to keep that in mind. Another example where this might be valuable, hemiarthroplasty alone, is the neuropathic joint. Um, there's a comment here about coracal chromial ligament deficiency. That's really that anterior superior scape. Nothing works like a reverse. If you have that problem, you're going to be you can try whatever you want. The reverse will be the final answer inevitably. Um, the, ro the status of the rotator cuff is the most influential factor affecting postoperative function in hemiarthroplasty as well as total shoulder arthroplasty, and um, and that's the way it goes. Preoperative imaging, we've kind of gone over this in pretty good detail uh, with regards to arthritis. We're particularly interested in the axillary view because of what happens, as you see here, uh, the posterior wear on the glenoid and subluxation. This makes this a more challenging uh, procedure, and we know the results are not as successful, and that's because we have problems with the glenoid. Uh, this is a shoulder here, of course, that doesn't look arthritic. It's centered well, and we're trying to see that axillary lateral view. A CT scan is very valuable uh, to really understand this. And even if you don't use one of these modern day uh, patient specific instrumentations or all these fancy tests, just getting the CT scan and thinking about it and analyzing it, you'll be better off in the way you actually put your implant in place. So it's very important to plan preoperatively, especially as the glenoids get more complex. And then if you're not sure, the MRI can be helpful for evaluation of the rotator cuff. Here's a a uh, small rotator cuff tear. It, this one looks repairable. Many of them in osteoarthritis, when they have a tear, it's kind of degenerative, thin, and flat, and we don't make an effort to repair those. The surgical technique gets done routinely through a deltal pectoral incision. Uh, the head is resected uh, at the anatomic neck. Uh, this really, this technique was developed about a little over 20 years ago and brought over from France and now has become the standard of care worldwide in terms of resecting the head at the anatomic neck and then using a system that allows you to put in a humeral head that matches uh, what was that patient's previous normal head height and radius of curvature and then variable types of stems to hold it in the right place. Um, again, what we try to do is we 
we, this idea of 30 degrees of retroversion is sort of the concept, but in fact, what we try to do is match it up with the patient's anatomy, which can be anywhere, uh, it can be much less than that, can vary quite substantially. Uh, the 30 degrees is, uh, is a kind of a, a guideline uh, to help you put it in the right spot. And as you see here, if you, if you don't, you may lead to instability problems. Um, you remember when there's a complication, when it comes out the front or dislocates, that's usually a subscapularis failure. And if it goes out the back, that's usually a failure of the surgeon to correct the version or the problems on the glenoid side. Those are the most common things that happens with instability after shoulder arthroplasty. Um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, approach here, this is again just another way to look at this. This is an example of a concept of putting in or packing bone on this medial side to keep the implant uh, from drifting into a varus position. It's a nice little idea to do things. Uh, here's a, a couple of things. You really don't want to overstuff the joint. I think a lot of surgeons still put in the humeral head about one size too large because they're so nervous about making them too loose and unstable. And as you get more experience at this and you get used to putting in a slightly smaller head than you actually think it looks like, because remember there's cartilage and deformity, it actually looks beautiful on x-rays and the patient's range of motion is fantastic. Uh, tuberosity reduction, of course, that's about fractures. Um, and we want to make sure uh, that uh, when we do a hemiarthroplasty for fracture, we get the greater tuberosity underneath the articular surface in the right spot. And for, uh, for fractures, we go very slowly for the first uh, six weeks and then start a range of motion program. Um, hemiarthroplasty for young patients, uh, again, a very controversial subject. There are some ideas about putting in a hemi and reaming the glenoid that uh, some surgeons have talked about. Uh, the literature would still suggest that a total shoulder arthroplasty gives the best pain relief uh, for osteoarthritis, and that's even in young patients. The concern is, is that younger patients have a more diffuse uh, list of diagnoses and uh, the longevity of, the, especially on the glenoid side, is not as long as it is in our older patients, unfortunately. And so that's a real concern that we have. Um, this is um, uh, just, again, an example where a cuff tear arthropathy head was used, as you see on the left here, and they have anterior superior escape, and there's really only one procedure, as you've heard me say more than once, that works for that. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.